Hello everyone, I am back and let me update you on what I've been doing. Previously, I tried cleaning this uh, front cross member up and it didn't work out so well. I tried the spray at the car wash. Uh, I tried the, uh, what is that? LA's totally awesome, the yellow stuff. And I also tried the purple power. Of those three, the Purple Power did slightly better than the other two, but it was not impressive by any stretch. So I went on a quest to see what would work better. And I asked the group and they said, get some aluminum uh, chemical stuff, uh, mostly used for cleaning boats and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find any. And if I did, it was $50 a gallon. Uh, so I kept looking and finally by accident more or less I ran across this purple power aluminum brightener it is it came from O'Reilly's Auto was $17.99 a gallon and I thought ah oh, what the heck I'll try it out well the stuff is amazing I'm going to be using it from now on so let me explain what happened I washed those pieces off and they came somewhat clean, but they didn't come all that great to the point that it really would detract from the look of the car or at least the parts I'm putting together. Let me show you. So each of the other two, I allowed them to soak for 15 minutes before I cleaned them. This literally soaked for, I don't know, minutes, a couple of minutes. And you can see on the right is where I put the uh, aluminum brightener on. And on the left is what it looked like when I started. So you can see why I didn't like that starting finish. Now, if you look, I applied it briefly all over. In some places it did a pretty good job, other places uh, not so much, but I also didn't give it a lot of time. Um, I did rinse it off with water. Uh, let's see. And so this over here, I just I did the whole thing. And this part right here really came out nice. And it's I started with it, and so it also took most of the rust off of the steel. Uh, so anyway, in the future, I am going to use that all over. I'm going to get a spray bottle, spray it on, uh, let it soak. Let's see what the instructions say. I read them, but that was before. It says allow, oh, 20 to 30 seconds. For the stuff to work so i let it soak actually a little bit longer than that probably probably a minute or so but it did a great job and that was with minimal scrubbing i got one of these cheap brushes at wherever the heck uh dollar general i think it was it was a couple of bucks and i scrubbed it a little bit with that not a lot but a little bit all right the other thing is this is uh, Rick Doberton's suspension pieces. What his pieces consist of is these uprights right here, this cast aluminum piece right here and here. And then the rest of this is all uh, C5 Corvette stuff. So what his pieces do is they correctly locate the uh, suspension arms for the upper arms because on the Corvette itself, these upper uh, arm mounts are built into the body of the car itself uh, so when you put this in something else it no longer has the body as a reference and then these angles right here uh, are designed to go on the ins no, on the outside of the frame rails so let me show you the frame rails here so there's the frame rails and ideally that part would that angled piece angled aluminum piece would go right here uh, underneath and then you drill holes and bolt it together so this is the frame for the delahaye uh usa uh hellahaye it's going to have a hellcat engine came from strickland racing uh he designed this for me this is the other suspension piece this is the front suspension uh, Rick was out of the uprights for it and so all I could set on is the one side I'm waiting for him to send me the second side uh, you can see what this looked like uh, before 
uh, any of the acid. You can see how, uh, what is that, red, brown, tan, whatever it was. And again, just soaking it for a minute or so uh, with that cleaner makes it look like the other one. Uh, this is one of the few pieces that did come looking pretty decent uh, from the car wash and the other cleaners. So it does a decent job, but again, there's night and day difference. Uh, this one will come out looking like brand new uh, once I apply that. Uh, the brake calipers really look bad. And again, that thing, uh, aluminum cleaner brightened it up significantly. One of the things I had to do was to remove the uh, leaf spring, cross member leaf spring. Corvettes use a single transverse leaf spring front and rear not using that uh, going forward. So I had to remove it. There's adjustment bolts on each end that not only hold it in place, but also allow you to adjust the ride height. And then, well, that's kind of strange. On the other piece, there was a clamp that goes across here. I don't see it on here. Yeah, oh, it's missing. See, there would be a clamp right here that goes across, it's missing on this. I don't know why that is, why that would be missing, but actually it saved me the work of having to remove that because I don't need it anymore. So I will work on this a little bit later. Um, oh, this brings me to a very important thing if you decide to use Rick's setup. So his setup comes with bolts and nuts, locking nuts. Here you go. Looks like a typical nylock locking nut. It's not, it's anything but. So this is a heads up to you. He does warn in the instructions, hey, when you tighten this down, be sure you put anti-seize on the bolt or else it's going to be difficult to remove it in the future. Well, I assumed that he was talking about the typical, okay, you know, after a couple years and, you know, some corrosion and whatever, dissimilar metal things that the two pieces without uh, anti-seize would eventually seize together. He's not. It literally seizes together immediately. So when I was test assembling this thing, I wanted to tighten everything down so that it was all aligned and it wouldn't, well, that doesn't rock. Anyway, this, this rocks a little bit. There's, these are not tight because I learned. So one of these, I tightened it, I mean, just a little bit past, you know, where you first hit the bolt uh, hits the, there we go. Tighten it down and the bolt hits the, what looks like nylon. Obviously it's not nylon, it's something else. Uh, and I just turned it a little bit past that and I stopped and went off and assembled the rest. When I went to go take it off, I literally could not get it loose. I mean, I was pulling, I was using a half inch uh, drive ratchet and socket right here pulling literally as hard as I physically could. I had my feet braced against uh, the upright there, and I had this on the bottom side. I had another socket set on the top uh, to hold it, and I literally could not get it done. Uh, it was that bad, and it wasn't just a couple of turns. You know, I only turned it a couple of turns past where it met. The whole way trying to get it apart it was almost impossible to get apart. I was afraid of breaking my ratchet, honestly. That's how tight it was. So anyway, a heads up to you. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever, and I'm going to replace every one of these with a more conventional uh, nut because I'm planning on assembling and disassembling this thing several times to get everything aligned plus my cleaning you see i just sprayed it on there uh actually poured it or brushed it or whatever and didn't really do a thorough job of cleaning it up so at some point i will probably disassemble this whole thing and get all the parts cleaned or blasted or whatever and 
I definitely do not want to run into the issue that I ran into uh, with this that was so hard. Now the anti-seize may solve that issue, but after fighting with that so much, I'm not willing to take that chance. Anyway, just wanted to warn you about that. I never would have expected uh, whatever this magical material is uh, to lock that tight. The good thing is, if you do decide to use this, one, make sure everything's already exactly where you want it. Two, make sure that you do use the anti-seize. And three, I don't think you'll ever have to worry about these bolts coming loose in the future. All right, that's all I have for now. I uh, just wanted to update you with where I'm at. I am going to use some more of the uh, cleaner in a little bit. I haven't cleaned the bottom side. I need to flip this over, but it's pretty heavy. Uh, before I do that, though, I did want to go ahead and replace the hardware with uh, correct or better, what I consider better, uh, nuts that aren't going to cause that issue. So I have to go find time to go drive to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, whatever, and get some hardware and replace those pieces. But once I do that, this will be uh, assembled temporarily until I need to disassemble it. Um, I was talking to Charlie who made the chassis and about the options for what to do about the cradle and the fact that this cradle is two inches too narrow to fit underneath the chassis the way it is. So the way Rick describes it is, well, what you do is you cut this down the middle and then you spread it out to get it to mount correctly on your chassis. All right, that works, but then you've got to do something to reconnect it, typically weld it or put a plate in there or whatever. The other issue is then the um, axle shafts are out an inch further on each side. And if you look, it has engagement splines here and here. And I'm guessing that's two inches, something like that. So if I widen this, then these axles are going to move out an inch and there will be only one inch of engagement between this and the center section. And since I'm planning on putting a 700 horsepower engine in there, I don't think I should be reducing any of the contact there. So what I'm thinking we may do is narrow the frame back here. Now, it, in a typical case, it wouldn't be that big a deal because it would just be a straight member. The challenge here is that we copied the original Delahaye frame and it has these angled pieces here and here. So if it weren't for that, we could take it, cut an inch out of here, uh, cut that off, or cut an inch out of the middle if we wanted to, whatever, and we could move this uh, two inches narrower. But to do that is going to require a lot of work because of the addition of these. Plus, it's already all welded and done. What I'm thinking I'll do is once we determine where that goes front to rear, I'll come in here an inch, cut out a notch, and then that'll allow that piece to uh, attach there, bolt in there. So I'll cut out a notch and then re-weld that uh, as a inset notch and then go ahead and bolt it like it should be. Uh, in the future, what we'll do is obviously redesign this uh, to be narrower there, or we might use instead of a uh, four by four piece of aluminum, we could use a two by four, move it off. Anyway, it'll be a slight redesign. I kind of like the heftiness of uh, the four by four. So we may go ahead and leave that, like I said, move it in an inch. One of the things I really like about this frame is how light it is. So I can come here by myself and lift up half of the frame. So it is not horribly heavy. It is, it's not light, I mean, but if this was made out of steel, there'd be no way I could lift up. It would take two people at each end to lift up and carry this. And that's my goal, to have as lightweight of a car as possible and as powerful as I can get it, because after all, that's to me a definition of a hot rod. Okay, I think that's got it for now, but I wanted to show you what I've done and tell you about that aluminum cleaner. That stuff is absolutely amazing. Um, 
And what else? Oh, and warn you about those stupid nuts. I mean, I never ever would have suspected that. And I'd hate for you to do the same thing I did because it really, I, I mean, ser seriously, I was worried about breaking that half inch ratchet. All right, like, subscribe, hit the alert, hit the thanks. And a little favor. I got entered into a program on Meta Facebook that um, basically they're saying, hey, we want you to promote your channel and we will reward you for promoting your channel. Uh, and we'll do that by giving you a bonus. Uh, in the next three months, they want me to increase the engagement and size of my audience. And you get rewarded based on how well you do that. So I need your help. If you can like, subscribe, hit the alert, uh, make comments. You can make silly comments, good comments, say hi, whatever. I'm assuming a comment counts as a comment, so it's the count there. Uh, if you can forward it to your friends that might be interested and have them come on, join, subscribe, like, all of that, and make comments, all of this will help. The uh, high bonus is $30,000. Um, I don't know if many of you realize how expensive this has been for me to do these projects, but it's been very expensive and I'm honestly running out of money. So that $30,000 would be a significant benefit uh, to me and my channel, uh, but it's through Meta. So in the link, I will give a link to my Facebook slash Meta page. And that's where you need to make the comments and all of that. I'm sure it wouldn't hurt for YouTube, but it will definitely be helpful um, on my Facebook meta page. The other thing I wanna bring up is a lot of people think those of us that have some kind of YouTube or Facebook following are getting rich off of this. The honest truth is I make about $2.16 a week off of doing these videos and putting them on my Facebook uh, combined. So I'm not gonna ever get rich at $2.16 a week. So this $30,000 would make a huge difference. It would actually make uh, the investment and time of doing this somewhat worthwhile because at $2.16 a week, it's definitely not a winning proposition. All right, that's all I've got. So uh, have a great day. And if you don't like what I'm doing, you don't know Jack. Bye.